So we're live. Sure. All right, all right, all right. Come on now, load. Oh, there we go. I'll just let that start up. Hello, everyone. I am Shay. Uh, this is my my storybook talking show where I just read a book and everyone can listen. Um, if you play games, you can you know draw inspiration from them. A lot of what I do, a lot of my inspiration comes from stories. So um, it's it's just a source of inspiration. Um, Today I'm going to be reading. I'm going to be continuing to read, and this is this is still kind of a new thing that uh, that we're trying out for Party Wave Gaming. Um, but I'm going to be continuing a book called Shipbreaker by Paolo Bacigalupi. Um And um, feel free to comment, talk, ask questions, say anything, or just chill out and have a nice cup of tea, just like me. Um, but I'll read for a couple hours and before calling it, um, Ren, yes. well, my screen is showing Oh, never mind. It fixed itself. Okay. I was going to say, yeah, should be fine now. Um, uh, hmm. Okay. Uh, but a little bit of a synopsis. This book is about some is about a shipbreaker. Basically, some kids who break down old oil tankers. A little bit of post-apocalyptic feel. A um, little bit dystopian. Um, but it's it's a new world. Calorie companies run the world. We will be following the story of Naylor, who basically goes into the guts of ships, pulls out all the wiring and everything. Very dangerous job. Um, almost got killed by one of his crewmates who wanted to abandon him and, you know, take all the oil for herself. That didn't go so well. Um, but he got he got out. He survived. Everyone's calling him the lucky boy. Um, storm passed through. Uh left a lot of people dead. It's basically a hurricane. Um, uh, but survived that too. And amid all the all the chaos and everything, they found a boat. Um, a great a not one of the oil tankers, but a fancy boat. And so him and his his, his friend climbed on board and the two of them scoured the boat and found a lot of valuable silver. And we're going to try to make new lives for themselves. And then found a survivor, a very obviously wealthy girl. Um, and we're going to pick up from there. Um, just as uh, they notice Naylor's father, who's very abusive, coming down the stretch of beach. Uh, it's going to be fun. We get to we get to see just how bad desperate people can be, or good, depending on who they are. I'm sure. This is sure. Uh, everybody's an upstanding person in this book. <laughs> That's a lie. Don't believe it. The father's love for his son is in it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> But we'll find out where that goes. Uh, was there anything you wanted to say, Ren, before we get started? Oh, that was it. <laughs> okay. Um, um, all right. Oh, uh, the music bots are still being uh, banned by YouTube, so the ambiance is just playing from my screen. So unfortunately, you don't get the love. Rain and 
fireplace. Well, I can't read without rain. I, That's not true, I can. I was going to say, if you really wanted it, you could open it yourself. I mean, that could work, too. Um, uh, really, though, I mean, rain, I, I do like rain for that purpose, if I'm going to be honest, but I don't need it. Um, rain makes me sleepy, anyway. The very consistent pitter-patter melody. Anywho, without further ado, I think we can dive back into the story. Richard Lopez was fast. Coming across the sand flats where the water had run out, he had a surprisingly big crew with him as well. All his hungry ones, the ones who did rough work, kept the yards in line when it suited them, did nothing the rest of the time. They glinted with scavenged jewels, with steel necklaces and copper twists on their biceps. Crew tattoos snaked over their skin. Men and women who had done heavy crew work and then slipped out of the yards and into the twilight life of the beach with its nail sheds and gambling dens and opium hovels. Naylor watched them, forcing down the creeping fear he felt at the sight of his father's grinning features in the spyglass. He recognized a couple of the others, a hard-faced stringy woman who everyone called Blue Eyes and who scared Naylor maybe even more than his father scared him. He startled at the sight of another, a full foot taller than the, than any of the others, and massively muscled. Tool, the half-man, who Naylor had seen last at Lucky Strike's side. He recognized another, Steel Liu, Liu, a skullcracker from the Red Python gang. All of them bad news, no matter how you cut it. The dragons on his father's shoulders rippled. His father was leading the whole band, striding ahead, grinning, showing his tangled yellow teeth. Through the scope, he was so big. It was so big it felt as though the man had already arrived. Naylor shivered, and it wasn't just the creeping affection in the back that chilled him. We need to hide. You don't think they already know we're here? Pima asked. We better hope not. Naylor tried to get to his feet, but it was too tiring to stand. He motioned for Pima's help. What's wrong with his dad? Nita asked. Naylor made a face as Pima hauled him upright. It was too difficult to describe all the things that Richard Lopez was. Talking about his dad was like talking about city killers. You thought you understood them, and then they were on you, and they were so much worse than you remembered. He's bad, he muttered. Pima got herself under his arm, supporting him, and started helping him down the slope of the deck. I saw him kill a man in the ring, Pima said. Beat him down and killed him, even after everyone had already won. Even after everyone said he'd already won. Beat him bloody. Left him with just his head cracked open. Naylor's face felt like it was carved from wood. He looked again across the shimmering water to his father's progress across the sands. He and his crew were coming fast. This time of day, they were probably already sliding high. If they get if they get hold of Lucky Girl, she's dead, Pima said. Your dad won't your dad won't want her getting in the way of scavenge. Naylor looked over at Nita. This would be a good time for your people to show up. Nita shook her head. Too soon, I think. She didn't even look to the horizon. What else can we do? Naylor and Pima exchanged glances. Let's get out of here, Pima said. Let them search the ship. There's plenty of good scavenge. Maybe it'll keep them busy and we can sneak back to the beach later. Tonight or something. Naylor stared, stared at the ant-like forms. You'll still be looking for me. Even when we go back. We don't know that. He's so damn high he probably doesn't even remember he has a son. Naylor remembered the time when his father... Naylor remembered the time when his father, high and angry, had taken the, had taken a man twice his size, blurringly fast, a broken bottle, 
and blood on the ground. He blew air out through his lips. Yeah, let's get out of here. You sure we can hide? Nita asked. You better hope so, Naylor said through gritted teeth as they helped him helped slide him clumsily over the side. Did they catch us? He shook his head. But aren't you family? Doesn't mean anything if the man's sliding, he answered. Even Naylor's afraid of his dad when he's high. Sliding? Is that a drug? Naylor and Pima exchanged glances. Crystal slide, you don't know it? She looked puzzled. Red Ripper, Pima tried. Blood rock, Naylor said. Dealy breeze, horny toads, bliss bleeders. She sucked in her breath. Bleeder. They both shrugged. Could be. She looked at them both, horrified. That's what shirt surge rats use. Combat squads, half men. It's for animals, she called herself. I mean, animals, huh? Naylor exchanged a tired smile with Pima. Yeah, that's about right. Just a bunch of animals here, making money for you big bosses. Nita had the grace to look embarrassed. Naylor stumbled out of the, out of the surf and stared up at the island's foliage above. Dizziness washed over him. He held out a hand to the rich girl. Help me. I don't think I can climb. The hall back up onto the island of undergrowth was a nightmare of pain and struggle. Finally, they huddled again at their makeshift camp. Nayla curled on the ground, panting and dizzy. Two hundred feet below, the white hull of the clipper was visible through the greenery. Shoots of Shouts of pleasure echoed up to them, cheers from the men and women as they swarmed onto the scavenge. They were laughing and whooping. Naylor tried to prop himself up so he could see what was happening below, but he was feeling worse and worse. Chills swept over him in, this, in steady surges, even though the sun was pouring down on him. I need blankets, he whispered. The girls wrapped him, but still he couldn't stand the sweeping chills and the ice that filled him. He shivered uncontrollably. Sweat dripped in his eyes. His teeth chattered, waves of fever surging through. Below, his fathers and his cronies clambered over the wreck with the feral grace of tiger monkeys. We are so screwed, Pima muttered. Nayla could barely speak through his chattering teeth. He wanted to tell Pima to check the far side of the island to make sure they weren't going to be surprised to tell Swanky Nita, Chon... Chandhuri that she needed to keep her damn head lower. That the adults below weren't smart, but they had, but they were plenty sly. And they'd look around sometime. At some point, they'd get tired of hooting about all the wealth and start making sure they had scavenge protected for themselves. He wished they fled before the tide had come. It was stupid not to assume that someone would be coming. The ship was too big not to attract notice. Little scavenger much time to profit before the lions rolled in and took over the vast chair of me. And now they were hiding and watching and stuck while the lions stalked through the ship's carcass and lapped and cracked open liquor they'd found in the galley. They tossed plates of silver onto the deck and shattered fine china against the rocks with shouts of pleasure. China that even he and Pima had guessed might be more valuable than the silver it sat beside. Then again, if you couldn't smelt it, it wasn't worth a copper yard on the shipbreaking beach. So maybe they were right to destroy it all. Maybe, maybe they should light the damn ship on fire, turn the sky black. Naylor shivered. He was going crazy. He needed to lie still. He was so tired. He needed to lie down and rest. We need to get you back to the shipyards, Pima whispered. Naylor shook his head. No, they'll get lucky, girl. I don't care. Let her hide, hide or be found. You need medicine now. He could barely force the words through his chattering teeth, but he stared at her hard as he could, trying to make Pima understand. She's crew, yeah? Blood marks, just like me and you. Pima looked away. Naylor knew what she was thinking. There is crew, proved over years of scavenging together and sharing the take, 
sharing the risks of thefts, putting a aloe on belt marks after bad night with Richard Lopez, fighting to get onto light crew and then sweating hard to keep the quota coming through. And then there was day old crew. Pima, he clutched at her. If you think I've got the fever eye, then you better believe we need to keep our lucky girl sorry, safe. Even if she's a blood, blood buyer, we need her. Pima didn't answer. Nita crouched beside him, studying him with concern. He needs a doctor. Don't tell me what he needs, Pima snapped. I know damn well what he needs. She peer peered through the ferns at the men below. No way we can get him across the flats without them catching sight of us. And then they'll want to know what we found. She shook her head. We're trapped. I could go down, Nita offered. It would distract them. Nayla shook his head violently. Pima, still studying her. She looked to the men again, grimacing. If you actually knew what you were offering, I'd let you do it. She shook her head. No way. She glanced at Naylor. Your crew. Your crew, anyway. She almost said it like she meant it. Well, well, a familiar voice interrupted. What we got here? The sunburned face of Naylor's father peered through Kudzu vines, grinning. I thought we saw something moving. His eyes widened with surprise. Naylor? His eyes flicked back and forth, skitter quick, high and fast, looking all of them over. What are you kids up to? Scavenging ahead of us? His gaze fell on Lucky Girl. And who's this pretty little thing? His eyes scanned her, wide and fascinated, then he grinned again. Soft girl like you could come off it. So soft girl like you could only come off a big boss boat. He smiled at Naylor. Didn't know you were crewing with Swanks, boy. His wide blue eyes swept over her. Potty lingered. Pretty. She's our crew, Naylor said through his shivering. Yeah? A knife flickered into Richard's hand. Come on down, then. All of you. Together. Let's get a good look at what the light crew's got for us. He turned and shouted, Up here! A moment later, blue eyes and the half-man tool and a couple others surrounded them and goaded them out of their camp. They scrambled clumsily back down through the weeds and ferns with Naylor's dad's friends all making comments. They whistled at Pima and Nita, slapped and pinched them, laughed harder when Pima tried to fight. Then they were out and collected on the clipper ship and the men and women gathered around. You have scavenged for us, the huge you have scavenged for us, the huge half-man asked. He lifted Nita up as though she weighed nothing at all, bringing her face close to his own blunt, dot-like pictures. He studied her jeweled nose ring with his yellow eyes. It's a diamond, he announced. Everyone laughed. One huge finger touched the jewel. Do you want to give it to me, or should I rip it off your pretty face? Nita's eyes widened. She'd reached up and unclasped her jewelry. Damn, Richard said. Look at all that gold. While the half-man held her, he and Blue Eyes ripped the rest of the rings off Nita's fingers. Nita cried out, but Naylor's father held his knife to her neck, and she held still as Blue Eyes ripped the gold off, leaving bloody streaks. They all whistled at the amount of blinding metal. More than a year's worth of profit of, of, of the rings, let alone all, all of them. The adults were rich, and they were drunk on it. Naylor crouched, shivering on the deck, watching as they tore away Nita's wealth. Even with the sun burning down from overhead, he was freezing. And now, he was almost uncontrollably, uncontrollably thirsty as well. The last of the rain and the storm water had evaporated, and if there was more water in the bowels of the ship, he couldn't stand to find it, and none of his father could. Father's crew was likely to let Pima and Nita go look. All of the adults hunkered on the vessel, calculating their scavenge and scheming how to ensure their claim. We have to let, we we'll have to cut Lucky Strike in, his father announced finally. We get half, but we don't end up bloody, and he can move the scavenge out of the train, out on the train. 
The rest of the crew nodded. Blue eyes glanced over at Naylor and Pima and Ida. What about this wank? Our little girly, his father looked over at Nita. You going to fight us for scavenge, sweetheart? No. Nita shook her head. It's all yours. Naylor's father laughed. Maybe you say so now, and maybe you change your mind later. His knife flashed in his hand. He came over and crouched beside her, the big knife gleaming over his knuckles, ready to slit her open the way he gutted a fish. No big thing to dump her intestines in the ground. Just a way to get food, not even personal. I won't stop you, Pima Nita whispered, her eyes dilating in terror. No, Nailer's father shook his head. You're right about that, because your guts are going to be feeding, feeding the sharks and no one's going to care what you have to say, yes or no. Maybe in your big boss house people care what happens to you, he shrugged. Here, you're nothing at all. Through his delirium, Naylor could see his father building father's building willingness to do violence. He recognized the signs when his father would strike quick as a cobra and slap Naylor upside the head or yank him close to sink a fist into his stomach. The gutting knife gleamed bright in the high sun. His father dragged Nita close. Naylor tried to speak, tried to say something that would save her, but he couldn't get the words out. The chills were coming the chills were coming so fast now. Out of nowhere, Hema lunged, her knife flashing. Naylor tried to cry, cry out to warn her, but his father beat him to it. He slammed Pima aside. She sprawled out on the decking. Her knife skittered across the carbon fiber and disappeared over the side. Pima was bigger than most of the light crew, but she was nothing against his father's crystallized speed. The man grappled with her for a moment, then twisted her into a chokehold. His crew rushed over, shouting. Tool got to her first, yanked her upright, lifting her from the deck entirely. He pinned Pima's arms behind her, leaving her writhing, struggling fruitlessly. A necklace of blood beads glinted, ruby on his father's neck. Damn, girl, you nicked me. He grinned and ran his fingers down the wound. Held up his hand, slick with blood. Naylor was amazed that Pima had come so close. She'd been so fast. His father inspected the red smear thoughtfully, then showed it to her. Close? <laughs> he laughed. You should fight in the ring, sweetheart. Pima struggled against their straining hands. Naylor's father slipped close. You almost got lucky, girl. He gripped Pima's face with his bloody fingers. So damn close. He held up his knife in front of her eyes. My turn now, right? Cut her, someone in the game whispered. Open a wide, blue eyes urged. We'll scavenge your blood for an offering. Pima shuddered in Tool's grip, but she didn't flinch as Richard touched her cheek with his blade. She'd gone away, She'd gone away already, Mailer guessed. She knew she was dead. He could recognize it, her acceptance of the fates. Dead, Naylor coughed. She saddened us, girl. She saved you in the storm. His father hesitated, pulling the knife to Pima's face. He traced it across the girl's jaw. She tried to kill me. Naylor tried again. Even up with Sanda. Life for life, balance the scales. His father scowled. You always were the smart boy, weren't you? Always trying to tell your dad what to do. Always fool yourself. He let his knife slide down between Pima's breast to her stomach. He looked over at Naylor. You trying to tell me what to do now? You telling me I can't put her guts on the ground? Think I can't open her if I want? Naylor shook his head violently. You want to gut her? That's your right. She drew, drew blood. His teeth chattered. It was a fight just to stay conscious. Pima and Nita were staring at him. Naylor continued. You want blood? It's yours. It's your right. He was feeling worse, feeling more and more dizzy. He took a breath, trying to remember even what he wanted to say. Forced the words out carefully, enunciating. Pima's mom helped me pull you out when the storm came. 
No one else would have helped me. No one else could have. He struggled helplessly. We owe Sadna. Damn boy. Richard cocked his head. It still sounds to me like you're trying to tell me what to do. Tool's voice rumbled. Perhaps a lesson for the girl instead of a death. A gift of wisdom to the young. Miller looked up at the half-man, surprised, and tried to press his advantage. I'm just saying we owe our mom a blood quota, and everyone knows it. It's bad karma if people think we don't pay back. Bad karma. Haller's father scouted at him. You think I care? Balancing a blood quota shows no weakness. Tool rumbled. Richard looked from Naylor to Tool. Well, look at this. I guess everyone wants the girl alive. He smirked, then lifted his knife and drove it for her gut. Pima cried out, but Richard stopped short of spilling. Uh, stopped short of spilling blood. He grinned as he withdrew the the point from where it had dented her skin. Looks like you get a free one, girly. He took one of her hands in his, looked into her eyes. We're balancing the scale because of your mom, he said. But if you put a knife on me again, I'll strangle you with your guts. Got it? Pima nodded slowly, not blinking eye to eye. Got it. Good, Richard smiled. Pried open her hand. Smiled and pried open her hand. Pima gasped. As he grabbed her pinky, bone crackled. Naylor flinched at the sound. Pima screamed and then choked off her pain, whimpering. Richard took her ring finger. Pima's breath came in ragged gasp. He smiled, getting his head down so they were eye to eye again. Now you know better, don't you? Pima nodded frantically. But still... He wrenched her finger. Another bone snapped, and she cried out. Learn your lesson yet, he asked. Pima was shaking, but she managed to nod. Naylor's father grinned, showing his yellow teeth. Glad to know you won't forget. He examined her broken fingers, then got into her face again. His voice low with promise. I was nice to you. I could have taken every finger you got, and no one would have said I was wrong even with a blood debt. His eyes were cold. Remember that I didn't take as much as I could have. He stepped away and nodded at the hat. Let it go, Tool. Pima collapsed on the deck, whimpering and cradling her hand. Miller forced himself not to go to her, not to try and comfort her. He wanted to curl up in a ball on the hot deck and close his eyes, but he couldn't. He wasn't done yet. You're going to get the swing now. His shivering was uncontrollable. His father glanced over at the bound girl. You got something to say about that, too? She's damn rich, Naylor stuttered. If her people are looking for her, she's worth something. Maybe worth a lot. Maybe more than a ship. His father evaluated the girl, considering. You worth a reward? he asked. Dina nodded. My father will be looking for me. He'll pay to keep me safe. That right. A lot. This is my personal clipper. What do you think? I think you've got an attitude. Naylor's father smiled, feral and pleased. But you just bought your guts back, girly. He showed her the knife, and if your dad won't pay enough, we'll pig open we'll pig open you and see how you squeal. He turned to his crew. All right, boys and girls, let's get this scavenge off. I don't want to share too much with Lucky Strike. Everything light and valuable off the ship. He turned and looked out at the sea and hurry. Tides and the scavenge god don't wait for him. He laughed. Naylor let himself lie back on the deck. The sun blazed overhead. He was freezing. His father crouched beside him. 
When he touched Naylor's shoulder, Naylor cried out. Richard shook his head. Damn, lucky boy. Looks like you're going to need some medicine. He looked out across the bay to the ship breaking yards. As soon as we get some of the scavenge off, we'll go make a deal with Lucky Strike. You should have a cillin, maybe even a suppressor cocktail. I need it soon, Naylor whispered. His father nodded. I know, son. I know that. But when we show up, we're going to have to explain how we can pay for your meds. And then there'll be questions about how your old man got so much silver and gold. One of Nita's rings flashed in his hand. Look at this here. He held it up to the light. Diamonds. Rubies, probably. You found a swanky girl, all right. He shoved the ring into his pocket. But we can't sell until we've got the muscle in place. Otherwise, they'll try and pull it out from under us. He looked at Naylor seriously. This was a lucky find, boy. You gotta play it smart, though, or we'll lose it all. Yeah, Naylor said, but he was losing interest in the conversation. He was tired, cold and tired. Another wave of shaking swept over him. His father yelled at his men to bring some blankets. I'll be back, he said. Soon as we have the score secured, we'll get your meds. He stroked Naylor on the cheek. His pale eyes looked as bright and crazed as Naylor felt his own must be. I won't let you die, son. Don't you worry. We'll get you taken care of. You're my blood, and I'll take good care of you. And then he was gone, and Naylor sank into fever. Okay. I need a drink. That certainly went in a direction I wasn't expecting. For who? For Pima. Yeah. Yeah, I was expecting a group of money drunk men to go in a totally different direction. They almost did. Very prepared to write a content warning for the stream. <laughs> oh no! As you were, you, you were, you warned us. You were like, "It's not as bad," and I was like, "Oh no!" It is. Yes, it is not as bad. Oh, um, oh something. <laughs> Sorry, that was. Oh okay. Something had closed from my way. Okay. Cool. Hmm. Nothing. Hope everything's all right. Uh, apparently there was dump truck rollover highway. Definitely not good. Probably a long time for cleanup. At least it's not hot <laughs> out. Have to... uh, for, for Arizona, I imagine cool is 90 degrees. Um, today felt really nice and Probably about nine. And we get down to the seventy or during the day because it's a desert. Because it's yeah, it's either hot or really cold. Freezing. Because outside of the city, all the concrete will why it stays hot. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, um, that's, it's, it's, it's enough wealth, the promise of enough wealth is to keep them off of the, the three of them, at least for now. Um, but it's also, it also kind of, like, his well-being is, like, secondary to this. It's like, I'll get your medicine after I get this. I'm dying. It's like, yeah. If you can die one more. <laughs> Basically. <sighs> so that's your dad, huh? Naylor opened his eyes to find Nita kneeling beside him. He was lying on solid ground. The sound of the ocean far distant. A rough blanket covered him. It was a nightmare. A small fire crackled beside him. He tried to sit up, but his shoulder hurt, and he lay back again. Felt bandages, 
new ones, different from the ones Sana had given him a lifetime before. Where's Pima? Nita shrugged. They've got a fetching food, fetching food. Who? She nodded over at two shadows who sat not far away, smoking cigarettes and passing a bottle of booze back and forth, their gang piercings twinkling in the darkness. Rings running along the ridges of their eyebrows and studding down the bridges of their nose, noses. One, Moby, pale as a ghost, stringy and angular from sight sliding crystal. The other was a huge loom of a shadow and muscle, the half-man tool. They smiled at Naylor as he moved. Hey, hey, looks like Naylor's gonna live. Moby waved his liquor bottle at Naylor in a sort of toast. Your dad said you were, you were a tough little rat. Didn't think you were going to make it, though. How long have I been down? Nita studied him. I'm not sure you're really up. I'm up. Three days, then, so far. Naylor tried to open his memory, seeking any recollection of the last three days. They were dreams, nightmares, but nothing solid. Periods of heat and cold and shaking images of his father peering into his eyes. Nita glanced back at the two men. They were they were betting on whether you'd live. Yeah, Naylor grimaced and tried to sit up. What were the stakes? Fifty red Chinese. Naylor looked at her, surprised. Those were big stakes. More than a month's wages on heavy crew. The scavenging of the ship must have been successful. Who bet on me? Who bet on me living? The skinny one. The half man. The skinny one. The half man was sure you were dead. She helped him sit up. He didn't feel like he had a fever anymore. Nita pointed at the at a bottle of pills. Swank pills by the lettering on the side. They've been grinding grinding those up and putting them in water. The other guy, she paused, hunting for a name. Lucky strike, he sent a doctor. Yeah. You're supposed to keep taking the pills for for a day, for another ten days. Naylor eyed the pills with enthusiasm. Without enthusiasm. Three days unconscious. Your people haven't showed up yet? He asked. It seemed obvious that they hadn't. Nita glanced over at the men, suddenly nervous, then shrugged. Not yet. Soon, I think. Better hope so. She gave him a dirty look. As she turned away from him, he spied the manacle that connected her ankle to one of the big cypress trees. She caught the direction of his gaze. They're not taking any chances. Naylor nodded. A minute later, Pima appeared, chaperoned by a third bolt. Blue eyes. The woman had scars carved into her arms and legs, bits of scrap steel embedded in her face, and necklaces of scavenge twined around her throat. A long zipper, scar t uh, zipper of scar tissue on her side showed that she had made a devotional sacrifice to the harvesters and the life cult. She shoved Pima forward. Moby glanced over. Hey, careful with the kid, she's got my dinner. Blue eyes ignored him. Instead, looked at Naylor. He's alive. What's it look like? Moby answered. Of course he's alive. Unless he's a zombie, walking dead. Ooh. He laughed at his own joke. Pima distributed metal tins to the adults. Rice and red beans and ground sausage spiced. Naylor watched the food as it was passed around, entranced. It was astonishingly good eating. He didn't remember the last time he'd seen so much meat passed around so casually. As the food was handed to Moby and Tool, Naylor found himself salivating. Moby started to eat even as Blue Eyes watched him. You tell Lopez kid, Lopez's kid is alive? She asked. Moby shook his head between mouthfuls of rice and beans that he shoved in his hand. What the hell does he pay you for? Blue Eyes asked. He just woke up, Moby protested. Two minutes back in the world of living, if that. 
He elbow, he elbow Tool. Back me up. The little rat just woke up. Tool shrugged. Scooped up a handful of rice and meat chunks. Moby isn't lying this time, he rumbled. As he says, the little rat just woke up. He smiled, showing sharp canine teeth. Just woke up in time for dinner. He popped a mass of food into his mouth. Blue eyes made a face. She took Moby's tin away, handed it to Naylor. Go get your own feed then. Eat for, eats first. Until the boss he's awake. Moby scowled at her, but he didn't protest. Just got up and headed out. Pima crouched beside Naylor, spoke in a low voice. How you doing? Naylor made himself smile, even though he was already feeling tired again. Not dead yet. Must be a good day, then. Yeah. He dug into the fool, into the food. Pima jerked her head at Nita. We need to talk. Lucky girls people hadn't, haven't showed up yet. Her voice dropped to a whisper. Your dad's starting to get jittery. Naylor glanced at the guards. Jittery how? He's got his eye on her. Maybe like he wants to hand her over to blue eyes in the life cult. Keep ta keeps talking about how much copper he could make off her pretty eyes. She know what he's planning? She's not stupid. Even a swank like her can figure it out. Blue Eyes interrupted their conversation, squatting down beside them. Having a nice chat, Naylor shook his head. She's just checking on me. Good, Blue Eyes smiled, hard and cold, and shut up and finish your food. Tool showed his teeth from where he sat on his stump. Good advice, here he rumbled. Pima nodded and slipped away without protest. That was more telling than anything else. She was afraid. Naylor glanced at her hand, saw her, saw that her broken fingers were splinted on a bit of driftwood. Naylor wondered if it was if it was their if it was their breaking or something else that had happened in the last three days that made Pima so wary. Nita finished her food, said to no one in particular. I'm getting pretty good at eating with my hands. Naylor glanced over. What else would you eat with? Knife, fork, spoon. She almost smiled, then shook her head. Never mind. What? Naylor pressed. You're making fun of us, lucky girl. Nita's face turned careful, almost fearful, and he was glad about that. He scowled at her. Don't go looking down on us, because we don't have your swank ways. We could have cut your fingers off, and your damn and your damn knife, fork, and spoon wouldn't have been much good then, would they? I'm sorry. Yeah, sorry after you already said it. Shut up, Mailer, Pima said. She's sorry. Tool stared at Nito with his dead yellow eyes. Maybe not as sorry as she could be, right, boy? He leaned forward. Do you want me to teach your swank a lesson in manners? Nita suddenly looked very frightened. Naylor shook his head. No, never mind. She gets it now. Tool nodded. Everyone does eventually. Naylor shivered at the half-man's flat words. The disinterest in his voice. This was the first time he been this close to the creature. There were plenty of stories about him, though. About where he got the vast webwork of scars that decorated his face and torso. About how he waded through the swamps hunting for alligators and python. Peel said he wasn't afraid of anything. That he'd been engineered so he couldn't feel pain or fear. He was the only thing Naylor had ever seen his father talk about with careful respect rather than abusive authority. The half-man was damn scary, and watching the way Tool looked at the girl, he thought he knew why. Never mind, Naylor said again. She's fine. Tool shrugged and went back to his food. They all sat in silence, 
beyond the ring of their firelight, there was nothing except animal sounds and insects. The black wilderness of the jungles and swamps, the swelter of the interior. From the distant sound of the surf, Naylor guessed that that they were at least a mile from shore. He lay back on the ground, watching the flames flicker. The food had been good, but he was tired again. He let his mind drift, wondering what his father was planning and why Pima looked so worried, and what was going on behind Lucky Girl's swing eyes. He drifted off. Damn boy, you're awake, I hear. Miller opened his eyes. His father crouched over him, smiling, his tattooed dragons and bright crystal slide, slide and amphetamine eyes on him. I knew you'd make it, his dad said. You're tough like your old man. Tougher than nails, right? Just like I named you. Just like the old man. He laughed and punched Naylor's shoulder and didn't seem to notice Naylor flinch at pain. You look a lot better than a few days ago. Richard Lopez's skin was pale and sweating in the firelight. And his grin was wide and feral. Wasn't sure if we'd be putting you down with the worms. Naylor made himself smile, trying to gauge his father's crystal bright mood. Not yet, I guess. Yeah, you're a survivor. He glanced over at Nita. Not like the rich girl. She'd have been dead a long time ago if it wasn't for me saving her swing cast. He smiled at her. I'm always hoping your dad doesn't show up, girl. Naylor sat up and folded his legs under himself. Your crew hasn't showed? Not yet. His father took a swig of whiskey and offered the bottle to Naylor. Pima spoke up from across the circle. Doctor said he's not supposed to drink. Naylor's dad scowled at her. You trying to tell me what to do? Pima hesitated. Not me. Lucky Strake's doctor said it. Naylor wanted to tell her to shut up, but it was already too late. His father's mood had, sit had shifted. I should turn that off. His father's... Uh, <laughs> Sounds funny, though. Maybe. His... Where did I... Ah, I'm lost! Should have I found it. Shut up. <laughs> yeah. But it was already too late. His father's mood has had shifted. A storm gathering where there had only been clear skies before. You think you're the only one who heard that damn pill man? Richard asked. I'm the one that brought the pill man out. I paid him. And I got him to put my boy back together. He went over to Pima. The whiskey bottle swinging loose in his hand. And now you're telling me what he said. He leaned close. You want to tell me again? Just in case I didn't hear you. Pima had enough sense to shut up and duck down. Miller's dad examined her. Yeah. Smart girl. I thought you wanted to shut the hell up. No sense in kids these days. He grinned at his goons. Blue eyes and Moby grinned. Tool just studied Pima with his dog eyes. You want me to teach her a lesson? Here he rumbled. Remind her. Richard asked, What do you think, girl? Need a little lesson from Tool here. Maybe see if he teaches any better than me. Pima shook her head. No, sir. Look at that. Richard smiled. Polite now, ain't she? Neil tried to intervene. How come the swing's still here? Where's our people? Richard's attention swung back to Naylor. Wish we knew, don't we? Girl says her people are com coming for her. Says someone gives a damn, but nobody comes looking. No ships, no people in the tr in on the train, looking on the coast. Not a single swank showing up. Asking questions. He licked his lips as he studied Nita. It's starting to look like no one gives a damn about one little rich girl. Maybe she's not even worth her kidney weight. It'd be tragic if we ended up scavenging our rich girl for spare parts, wouldn't it? Should we try to reach out to her people? Naylor asked. Find a way to tell them where she is. Wish we knew where they were. From over in Houston? She, from over in Houston, she says. 
the Yapadaya Combine, some kind of shipping clan. Lucky Strike's got some people trying to track them down. Naylor startled. Yapadaya, he broke off as Pima flashed a warning signal. Naylor glanced at her, puzzled. Why had Nina lied about her name? If she was really with Patel Global, there should have been ways to contact her people right here on the beach. What's your plan? He asked and said. Hard to say. I've been thinking she must be worth a lot, seeing as how swing she is, but I'm also thinking that she's a bit of trouble for us. Maybe these Epidaya have big connections, boss connections. The kind that bring their skullcrackers in and make trouble for hard work like us. Naylor's father paused, thoughtful. Maybe I'm thinking she's too damn dangerous and we're better off if she's feeding the pigs. We already have her ship. And sure as hell she knows too damn much about it now. He said it again, quieter. Too damn much. But she's got to be worth something. Richard shrugged. Maybe she's worth a hell of a lot. And maybe that's even worse than if she's worth nothing. He looked up. You're a smart kid, Naylor. But you should pay attention to your dad. I've got some years on my skin, and I'll tell you. A swank like her always means trouble for people like us. They don't give a copy yard about us. And they sure like their own. Maybe they pay us for her. And maybe they come back with their guns and clear us out. Snake this instead of saying thank you. Nita protested. We wouldn't shut up, Swank. Richard's voice was flat, disinterested. He turned his cold eyes on her. Maybe you're worth something, maybe not. But I know for damn sure that your flapping mouth annoys the hell out. He pulled out his knife. I hear much more of you, and I'll take those pretty lips off. Make you smile, and then you're sad. Make you smile even when you're sad, little Swank. He stared at her. You think your crew would want you back without your lips? She fell silent. He nodded, satisfied. He sat down with Naylor, put his head low, close, almost touching. Naylor could smell the sweat and whiskey on him, see the redness in his eyes. You had the idea, boy, Richard glanced at the girl. But the more I think about it, the worse it sounds. We got a big score off the ship. Everything's going to be different now. We're damn rich. All set up with Lucky Strike. That clipper's down to the ribs now. Got real crews stripping it. Another couple days, it'll be like that ship never existed. He grinned. Not like breaking one of those old oil tankers. These little ships come apart easy. He glanced over at Lucky Girl. This girl doesn't do us any good, though. Maybe she makes big bosses pay attention to us. Maybe she makes us targets. Maybe she gets people asking questions about scavenge, where it came from, and who owns it, and who gets rich from it. No one would say anything to what? No one would say anything to the Swanks. Don't kid yourself, Richard muttered. They'd sell their mothers for a chance to pull a lucky strike. Give it time, Naylor whispered. Give it a little time, and we'll be even richer. All he could think about, think of, was how badly he wanted to get away from his father. With his twitchy eyes and fast, high smile. The face of a man deep in his slide. Richard's eyes went to the girl again. If she wasn't so pretty, I would have bled her out already. She draws too much attention. He shook his head. I don't like it. Naylor said, maybe we can get her people to pay for her without knowing who sold her. She's still secret, right? Naylor's dad grinned. Just my crew. He studied blue eyes and Moby and Tool. Maybe too many, though. Secrets don't keep when someone's throwing cash around. He glanced at the girl. Keep an eye on her for another day. We'll see what turns up. 
He stood and Naylor struggled to his feet as well, but his father pressed him back. You stay here. Rest. Sadness asking questions about where you and Pima went. I'm plain dumb, you know? Don't want anyone else knowing what's going on. Make sure they don't make any trouble. Sadness looking for us? Naylor tried to keep the hope from his voice. She heard a rumor. Maybe we found Pima. He shrugged. She's got no cash, though, and no one talks without red Chinese in their hands. He turned and nodded to Tool and Blue Eyes and Moby. Keep them tight. The three of them nodded, Blue Eyes smiling, Moby swinging from, swigging from his bottle, Tool and passive. Richard disappeared into the vines at a night screech of the jungle, a pale skeleton of a man fading into the black. When Richard was gone, Moby grinned and took another swig from his body. You're running out of time, girly, he said. You people don't show up quick. Maybe I'll take you for my own. You look like you'd make a nice little pet. Shut up, Tool rumbled. Moby glared at him and closed his mouth. Tool glanced at Blue Eyes. You watching first. Blue Eyes nodded. Tool pushed Moby a little ways. Push, Tool pushed Moby a little ways away, both of them bending down in the nearby bushes. Soon, a snore marked where Tool lay, and Moby's voice, complaining still, was barely audible through the ferns. Mosquitoes swarmed around them. Nina slapped miserably at the bloodsuckers. Everyone else ignored them. Blue eyes came over put a chain cuff around Pima's wrist, then turned to Naylor. You gonna give me trouble? What? Naylor gave her a look of incredulity. You gonna t going to tell my dad you put a cuff on me? I'm the one who came up with this lucky strike. Blue Eyes hesitated. She seemed tempted to, to chain him as well, but also unsure, certain, not entirely sure if he was a captive or an ally. He stared back at her, challenging. Naylor knew what she was seeing a skinny red boy just out of a fever and crazy Richard Lopez behind him. It wasn't worth it. Sure enough, Blue Eyes gave up on the idea. She sat down on a rock and picked up a machete. Started sharpening it. Pima and Lucky Girl stared at him, their eyes full of meaning. The fire burned lower. He didn't like his father's hints. The man was on the verge of a of decision and anything could tell. Naylor stretched out on the ground beside Pima. How are your fingers? She smiled and held up her hand. Pretty good. Glad he didn't decide to teach me five lessons. Hurt much now? Not as much as the money we lost. Her voice was brave, but he thought the fingers must hurt awfully. The splint looked rag ragged. The she followed the direction of his gaze. Maybe we can break him in and get him to grow straight. Yeah. He looked over at Lucky Girl. How you doing? Anything broken you? Shut up! Moby yelled from over the bushes. I'm trying to sleep. Naylor lowered his voice. People coming soon. Lucky Girl hesitated. Her eyes flicked fearfully from him to Pima, and then to Blue Eyes a little ways away. Yeah, they're coming. Pima looked at her. Yeah, that right? Patel? She, she drew out the name. They're really coming. Or he just full of lies. Someone from your crew could be down on the beach right now. Some blood buyer from your clan, if you're really a Patel. But you're not saying anything. What's with that? Again, the skitter of fear. Lucky girl pushed her black hair off her face and stared at Pima defiantly. What if they aren't coming? She whispered fiercely. What are you going to do then? Her voice had taken on, had taken on some of the hard edge of Pima and Naylor's own inflections. Naylor would have laughed if she hadn't seemed so fearful. She was lying. 
He'd seen enough liars in his life to know. Everyone was lying to him. Lying about how much they'd worked, how, about how much quota they filled, about whether they were afraid or they were living fat or starving. Lucky girl was lying. They aren't coming. He, sta he stated it as fact. You've got no one coming for you. I don't think you're even a Patel. Lucky girl, girl glanced at him fearfully. Her gaze went again to blue eyes, obsessively sharpening her machete. Pima tugged her earrings thoughtfully, cocking her head. That right, girl. You're worth nothing. Naylor was surprised to see that lucky girl was on the verge of tears. Even Sloth hadn't cried when she'd been kicked down the beach with, with knife slashes through her crew tattoos. But here... This soft girl was on the verge of crying because she'd been caught in a lie. Where are your people? he asked. She hesitated. North, above the drowned cities. And I am a Patel, but they won't know where to look for me. She paused. I'm not supposed to be here at all. We threw away our GPS beacons weeks ago, trying to get away. From who? She hesitated, then finally said, My own people. Naylor and Pima exchanged puzzled looks. Nita explained quietly. My father has enemies within our company. When we got caught in the storm, they were pursuing us. Everywhere we went, they anticipated us. If they catch me, they'll use me as leverage. So no one's coming looking for you? No one you would want to meet? She shook her head. When our ship wrecked, two other ships were pursuing us, but they turned back from the storm. So that's why you were sailing into a city killer. You were running. It was either that or surrender. She shook her head. It wasn't a choice we could make. So no one's coming for you. Naylor couldn't help repeating it. Trying to get his head around this new fact, he jerked us around this whole time. I didn't want you to take my fingers. Pima let out her breath in a slow hiss. You should have given you should have given yourself up to whoever was chasing you. Naylor's dead is worse than anything they could have done to you. Lucky girl shook her head. No. Your people, they have an excuse. The ones who hunted me, she shook her head. They're worse. They are worse. So you wrecked a whole ship and tried to drown yourself just so they couldn't catch you, Naylor asked. Killed your whole crew so you could stay free. She glanced over. They were... She shook her head. Price's people would have killed them anyway. He wouldn't have wanted witnesses. Pima grinned. Damn. The swings and their rust rats are all the same. Swings and the rust, rust rats are all the same at the end of the day. Everyone's looking to get a little blood on their hands. Yes, Nita nodded seriously. Just the same. Nayla considered the situation. Without someone to buy Nita back, she was worth nothing. Without strong friends or allies on the beach, she was just me. No one would even blink if she went under the knives of the harvesters. Blue eyes could hand her over to the colt, and no one would think twice about protecting her. Pima looked Nita over. Hard life here, or a swank like you. You won't survive unless you get yourself a protector, and there's not much percentage in sheltering someone like you. I can work. I can. You can't do anything unless we say so, he was said brutally. No one cares about a swank like you one way or the other. You got no crew, no family. You don't got your goons and money to make them respect you either. You're worse off than sloth. At least she knew the rules, knew how to play the game. You really don't have people then, Naylor asked. No one who might help you. We have ships, Nita hesitated. Our clan has ships and some of the captains are still loyal to my father. They come to the Orleans for the Mississippi trade. If I could get there, I could reward you. No more reward talk, lucky girl. Pima shook her head. You run out of that. Yeah, 
Taylor glanced over at Blue Eyes, who was sharpening the new machete. How about we quit the lying? He nodded at Nita scarred palm. We shared blood, and you're still lying to us. Nita gave him a dirty look. You would have cut my throat if you didn't think I was valuable. Naylor grinned. Guess we'll never know. But we got you now, and you're not worth the copper yard. He fell silent. Pima watched him. It's a damn long way to the Orleans, she said. Gators and panthers and python. Lots of good ways to die. Naylor considered. Don't only have to go over land. Can't sail it. Your old man would know if uh, a skiff was missing and be after you in no time. I'm not thinking about a skiff. He must stare at him. Blood and rust. She shook her head. No way. You remember, Rini? You remember what he looked like afterwards? There wasn't anything left in him. Just meat pieces. He was drunk. We won't be. Pima shook her head. It's crazy. You just got your shoulder pulled back together and you want to go wreck it. What are you talking about? Nita asked. Naylor didn't answer her directly. It was possible. It was just possible. You could run her, lucky girl. He looked her over. You got soft skin, but but you got any muscles under your skirts. You fast? She's too soft, Pima said. Nita looked at him fiercely. I can run. I took first in a hundred meter at St. Andrews. Mailer smiled at Pima. Well then, if St. Andrews says she can run, then maybe she'd be pretty fast. Pima shook her head and made a small prayer to the fates. Swanks run on funny little tracks against other swanks. They don't run for the life. They don't know how. She says she can run, Naylor shrugged. I say we let the fates judge. Pima glanced at the girl. You better be as fast as you say, because you only get one chance. Nina didn't blink. They ran out of chances a long time ago. It's all fates now. Yeah, well... Welcome to the club, lucky girl. Pima grinned and shook her head. Welcome to the damn club. Another drink. Sips. Mm-hmm. I did it again. Not as bad. Mm. Spilled a cup nice of drops. Well, it's the freaking top. It protects, you know, so I don't, like, spill on electronics or anything, but I'm not used to it. So every time I upend it, I have to upend it a little bit further, and then it gets on me. Fortunately, it's just water and herbs, so... Tea doesn't stain, does it? I don't think it's tea stains. Uh, tea does stain. It does. Well, then. Uh, what kind of tea? White acai. White tea shouldn't, shouldn't have much of. But yeah, it's kind of it's kind of like reddish. Uh, then I'd be careful. It's tea very much. Okay. Well, I'll handle that after this then. It's one of those uh, do-it-yourself, like, I mean, paper make maker things. You paint it with, give it that old parchment. Hmm. Ah, all right. Running or, not, running or not, they needed to get away from their captors. In whispered conference, they made a plan and settled in to wait. 
It was a fight for Naylor to stay awake. Even though he'd been out for three days, he was still having a hard time keeping his eyes open. The breezes in the trees and the warmth of the, air of the night made him sleepy. He put his head down, telling himself he would keep watch. Instead, he slept. Whoa, slept again. Blue eyes, alert and wide awake, switched to Tool, who simply sat and stared. Every time Naylor peeked between slitted lids, there was Tool, staring back at him with his yellow dog eye, patient as a statue. Finally, Tool stood down to Moby. The skinny, bald man sat on himself comfortably against a stump and started drinking. He was half reclined and it wasn't long before he had drunk himself back into a slumber, trusting in the shackles and the sleep forms of the young people for his sense of security. Naylor lay awake, waiting, glad to still be unrestrained, even if he wasn't one of his this adult crew. He was one of he was one of his fathers, and so he had some trust between association with his father and their own memories of him as a fever, feverish invalid. He had some wiggle room. He wasn't a risk in their minds, just a skinny light crew kid recovering from sickness. That was all to the good. The problem was that Blue Eyes had the keys to the girl's shackle. And she and she scarred the, and she scared the hell out of him. Nobody who got in with the life cult was good news. Novices were always looking for new recruits, and they were always hungry for sacrifices. As soon as Moby was snoring, Naylor began easing towards where he had seen Blue Eyes bed down. He went slowly, as slowly as a child who had learned to steal at an early age. Whose best chance of survival is in silence and remaining unnoticed? He gripped his duck knife with sweaty fingers, his hands slick with fear. There's no way to search blue eyes and find the keys without waking her. The knife felt small, useless in his palm, a toy. This was a necessary thing, but he didn't have to like it. It wasn't as if he felt guilty, he didn't. Blue Eyes had done worse in her time, and would do worse in the future. He had seen her torture people who held back on quota, or who fell behind on loans. He had seen her take off a man's hand for stealing from Lucky Strike, and then watch the man bleed out under her cool blue gaze. And who knew how many beach rats she drugged and collected into the mysteries of the church. She was hard and deadly, and Naylor had no doubt that if his father asked her to do it, she would kill him and Pima and Lucky Girl and sleep well afterwards. He didn't feel guilty, and yet still, as he stole close, his heart pounded in his chest and his blood thudded in his ears like beach drums. It was the sort of killing that his father would accomplish with proficiency. Richard Lopez understood the qualities of kill or be killed intimately. A zero-sum calculations that said it was better to be alive than dead, and he would not have hesitated to take advantage of a sleeping opponent. Quick and fast, Naylor told himself, cross the throat and be done. A few years before, his father had made him kill a goat to show him the method of the knife to show him how a blade pierced flesh and snagged on tendons. Naylor remembered his dad crouching over him, wrapping his fist around Naylor's own. The goat had lain on its side, legs bound, its sides heaving up and down like bellows, breath whistling through its nostrils at it as it sucked its last air. His dad had guided Naylor's hand, setting the knife against the goat's jugular. Press hard, he said, and Naylor did as he was told. Naylor parted the ferns. Blue eyes lay before him, her breathing gentle. In sleep, her features were smooth, un unbitten by the smolder of violence that lurked there otherwise. Her mouth was open. She lay on her belly, arms tucked under her, and held close against the relative cool of night. Naylor said a prayer to the fates. Her neck wasn't as exposed as he had hoped. He needed to strike fast. She needed to die immediately. He slipped close and steeled himself, 
ready the knife and leaned in, holding, holding his breath. Her eyes opened. Panic, Naylor rammed the knife into her throat. The blue eyes moved too fast. She rolled away, bouncing to her feet. She swept up her machete. She didn't say anything, didn't shout or beg or yell in anger. Her shadow blurred. Naylor leapt back as her machete whistled past his face. She lunged after him again. Naylor raised his knife, but instead of coming at him again with the blade, Blue Eyes swiftly, simply swept a leg under him. Naylor crashed to the ground. Blue Eyes landed on top, driving the air from his lungs. She slapped his knife away, leaving his fingers numb and stinging. He lay panting, pinned under her weight. Blue Eyes pressed the machete to her as You poor dumb kid, she muttered. Naylor's breath rasped out of him. He was shaking with fear. Blue eyes, smiled, and hefted her machete. She gently touched the right eye of her blade. I grew up with men sneaking up on me in the middle of the night. The blade moved and tapped lightly on his uh, on his left eye. A little lice spider like you doesn't stand a chance. She grinned and moved the machete back to his right eye. Pick, she said. Naylor was too frightened to understand. What? Blue eyes touched each of his eyes significantly with her blade. Pick, she said again, right or left. My dad Lopez would take both, she smiled, and I will too if you don't choose. Again, the blade caressed his eyeballs, right or left. Naylor steeled himself, left. Blue eyes grinned, right it is. She flipped the machete and drove it towards his eyes. A whirl of shadow crashed into blue eyes. The machete stabbed past his head, leaving a burn on his cheeks, and blue eyes and blue eyes wake him off him. She rolled, locked in a struggle with another form. Shouts rose all around in the darkness. Steel clashed, accompanied by the screams and whimpers and grunts of people fighting. There were people all around. Blue eyes and her opponent rolled, tangled limbs flashing, a furious scuffle in the moonlight. Naylor could make out his savior. Pima's mother grappling with blue eyes for the machete. Sadness slammed a fist into blue eyes' face. Bone crunched. Blue eyes bucked and tore free of Sadness' grasp. She rolled and came up with her machete. The two women circled. Break off, blue eyes, Sadness said. It's not your fight. Blue eyes shook her head. Boy, owes me, Sadness. Thought he could take my blood. Can't let that go. And then she swept forward, faking high with the machete before crashing low. Sadna leaped back over a mossy log and scrambled for footing. Blue eyes plunged after her, seeking seeking an opening. The blade whirled. Blood sprayed from Sadna's hands where she tried to ward off a blow. Sadna cried out, but didn't falter. Dodged from under Blue Eyes's follow-up cut. Blue eyes lunged again, testing. Run, Sadna, she said. Run. Blood ran from her nose where Sadna had crushed it, but she didn't seem to care. When she smiled, her teeth were black with it. Naylor scrambled to find his knife all around other bodies grunted and fought a tangle of forms that had, that had to be Sadna's heavy crew. He fumbled through the grasses, seeking the gleam of his blade. Sadna slipped behind a tree, using it for a shield. Blue eyes circled, chasing her, then stopped and smiled. I'm not playing chase, she muttered. You want the boy alive or not? She turned and lunged for Naylor. He scrambled away, but it was enough to bring Sadna out from behind the tree. Blue eyes reversed from her faint and surged toward Sadna in a flash of steel. No! Naylor shouted. The world seemed to slow. Blue eyes machete carved for Sadna's throat. Naylor watched, horrified, expecting a flare of blood from Sadna's neck. But Sadna wasn't there. She ducked and tumbled in the dirt, crashing into Blue Eyes' leg and knocking the other woman's feet. Again, they rolled and tangled, a whirl of limbs and a, mach and a machete's blade. Naylor cast about for his knife, saw it laying in the leaves. He grabbed it as Blue Eyes came up on top of Sadna, her machete pressed against Sadna's throat. Sadna's own fist gripped the machete as well, fighting to keep the edge from pressing home. Her breath rasped raggedly under the blade. Blue eyes increased the pressure. Naylor slipped toward Blue eyes, his knife slick in his hands. 
Sadna's eyes widened as he came up behind. As he came, blue eyes, warned of the threat, started to turn. Nailers leapt onto her back and ran the knife into her neck. Hot blood poured out, poured over his hand. Blue eyes screamed as his blade tore at the carotid muscle of her neck. Just like killing a goat, Nailer thought inanely. But blue eyes didn't die. Instead, she reared up, carrying him, reared up, carrying him, clinging on her back. He tried to yank out the knife and stab at her again, but the blade was stuck. Blue eyes, blue eyes flailed for him, trying to reach around and get a hold of him. Then bent forward sharply and tumbled and tumbled him over her back. He clung desperately, but she hammered him off with the hilt of her machete. Light exploded in his head. He hit the ground. Blue eyes stood over him, one hand pressed against the gushing wound, and the knife still embedded in her neck. She swung her machete at Ayla clumsily, swinging at, sw swinging that nonetheless whistled through the air. Her gaze followed him. Devil Bright determined to take him with her to whatever afterlife her promised. Curses bubbled out of her mouth. The blood's the blood with it. Thick. She lunged again for Naylor. Naylor dodged, trying to pin himself up against a tree or allow himself to trip. Why didn't she die? Why wouldn't she just die? Superstitious fear shot through him, through Naylor. Maybe she was actually a spirit, a zombie creature that could not be killed. Maybe the life cult had done something to her, made her immortal. Blue eyes slashed again, but as she lunged forward to follow up, she tripped, sprawled on the ground. Still, she reached for him. Nayla stood frozen before her. Her hand touched his feet, clutched for his ankle. Her blood was black in the moonlight, a deep pool spreading. Nayla yanked his foot away from her twitchy fingers. Blue eyes stared up at him, her lips moving, promising death, but no words came out. Sadna pulled him away from the dying woman. Come on, let her go. Blue Eyes' blood was all over him. The dying woman's eyes followed him, hungry. Her fingers twitched. Naylor shuddered. Why won't she die? Sadna glanced at the shuddering woman. She's dead enough. She ran, his, she ran her hands over him. Are you okay? Naylor nodded weakly. He couldn't take his eyes off Blue Eyes. Why won't she die? He whispered again. Sadna pursed her lips. Some people have more will to live. Where you don't hit them right and they don't lose their blood fast. Sometimes they just don't stop the way they just don't stop the way you want them to. She glanced over at the woman. Look, she's gone now. Let her go. She's not. Sadna jerked his face around to look into her dark body. Yes. She is. She's gone. And you're not. And I'm glad you were there when I needed you. You did good. Naylor nodded. He was shaking with adrenaline. Pima and Lucky Girl were freed, and they ran over to where Sana and Naylor squatted. Damn, Pima said. You're as fast as you did, even with that bad arm of yours. Naylor glanced at her. A shiver of fear washed over him. He... Killed thugs before. He had killed things before, chickens, that goat, but this was different. He threw up. Pima and Lucky Girl backed off, exchanging glances. What's his problem? Pima asked. Sadna shook her head. Killing isn't free. It takes something out of you every time you do it. You get their life, they get a piece of your soul. It's always a trade. No wonder his dad's such a devil. Sadna shot her daughter a hard look, and Pima fell silent. Other people from Sadna's heavy crew were all around, cleaning up from the attack. It turned out that Richard had had more sentries posted than Naylor had guessed. Perimeter guards that had never even that he had never even seen. He felt doubly lucky that Sadna and her crew had arrived. He and Pima and Lucky Girl would never have gotten out on their own. Suddenly. Tool's dog-like face rose from the shadow. Watch out! Naylor screamed. Sadness spun, and 
stopped and relaxed at the sight of the half-man. She turned back to Naylor and patted his arm. He's fine. He's the one who told us where to look for you. We've got a good history, don't we, Tool? Tool came over and stared down at the body of Blue. His expression flat. For a long time, he didn't say anything. Finally, he turned his dog gaze on Naylor. A good kill, he said. As fast as your father. I'm not my father. Not as skilled, Tool shrugged. But the potential is there. He nodded at the black puddle around blue eyes and smiled, showing, showing his needle teeth. Blood tells you have good potential. Naylor shuddered at the thought of mirroring his father. I'm not like him, he said again. Tool's smile disappeared. Don't be too sorry, blue eyes, the half-man rumbled. It's human nature to tear one another apart. Be glad you came from a, such a successful life. Leave him alone, Pima said. Where's Lucky Girl? He asked. The rich girl? Sad enough pointed. She's gone down to the beach. Her people are there, looking for her. A whole clipper ship of them showed up an hour ago. She looked over at Tool. Richard was... Richard was trying to meet with them, looking to broker a deal. Her people are here? Naylor glanced at... glanced at Pima, puzzled. She told us no one knew where she was. He trailed off, wondering if he had been lied to again. Nita burst back through the clearing. It's them. Your people? He asked skeptically. She shook her head, gasping. The ones who were chasing me. Pisces people. He's got half man. Sadna studied her. The ones on the beach? They're your enemies? Nita could barely breathe. They want me for leverage against my father. Well, they know you're here, Sadna said. Richard as much claimed it when they came ashore. Lucky's Lucky girl's face took on a shade of panic. I can't let them catch me. I need to hide. Sadna and Tool exchanged glances. If you go into the jungle, Tool shook his head. Lopez will know to hunt for her. How will you supply her with food? Who will stand for her when he catches her? Better to let her flee. Naylor spoke up. We were planning on catching the salvage train to the Orleans. She says she's got crew who would protect her. Sadna frowned. Can't go into the loading yards. No one gets in there without Lucky Strike known, and Richard and Lucky Strike are tight now. We can catch the train outside once it's moving. Dangerous. Not as dangerous as waiting around to see what kind of deal my dad cuts planks. Tool looked thoughtful. It could be done if they are quick. She says she's fast, Naylor said. If she isn't, she could die. No no worse than than she ends up otherwise. What about you, Naylor? Is that a risk you want to take? Naylor started to answer, then stopped. Was it? Did he really want to tie himself to this girl? He shook his head, irritated. The fact was, he had already set himself in conflict with his father. There was no hope for resolution now, no matter how much he might have wanted it. Richard Lopez would never leave an insult like the killing of his crew unanswered. It's it's not safe for me here, Naylor said. Not now. He'll come after me with everything, Scott. He can't afford to lose this lose this much face. Too many people would be laughing. Sadness shook her head. I can't do this thing. I can't leave my crew. No one will be with you. With me and Pima. Pima shook her head. No, I'm not doing it. You're not? I'm not leaving my mom. But we talked about getting out. Getting away from here. Naylor tried to keep his desperation from his voice. For some reason, he had assumed that they were crew and that they were together. You talked about it. Not me. Naylor stared at her. Pieces clicked into place. Hima had family. Something to cling to. Something solid. Of course, she wouldn't risk the run. He should have seen it. Naylor forced himself to nod. 
Still, we can catch the train and make it to the Orleans in two days. It can't be that hard. Pima held up her hand, showing him her splinted fingers. You think? Rini had both hands for the jump, and he still ended up looking like ground pork. Sadna looked down towards the beach. We can broker a truce with your dad. Naylor, I can protect you. If you think so, then you really don't know my dad. Naylor shook his head. Anyway, I don't want that. I want out. Lucky girl says she can get me out if I help her. Sadna glanced at the girl. You believe her? I'm telling the truth, Nita said, started hotly. Adna waved her to silence. Really? She looked at Naylor. You're sure she was worth it? No one ever is, Tool rumbled. My father can pay, Nita said. He can reward Shut up, Pima said. She turned to Naylor. Naylor decides. He's the one he's the one to take you. He's the one to take the risk. She grabbed Naylor, pulled him aside. She lowered her voice. Sure about this. She glanced back at Nita. The girl's sly. Every time she tells us something, it turns out it's only half true. I believe her. Don't. Swings don't think like us. She'll have an angle. You sure you're watching yourself? There's no risk. I've got nothing here. There's no way I can keep clear of my dad if I stay. Naylor shrugged. Pulled away from Pima's grip. My dad will never forget this. No matter what anyone says, he'll never forget. He looked at Nita and spoke loudly to the group. You'll go. I'll take her. A flurry of activity down below startled them all. Nita scrambled up on a boulder, peering through the foliage. Get up here, lucky girl, she said. Nita climbed up beside Pima and Naylor joined them. Out on the dark water, a pale ship was anchored. Lights glowing like the day, lights glowing like the day, bright LED spots sweeping the water, catching the shapes of boats rowing towards the shore. Nita shook her head. They're coming for me. They'll pay a reward, too, Pima's mother said to Naylor. Mom, Pima shook her head. We're crew, Naylor said stubbornly. I'm not selling her. Pima's mo mother study, Naylor. You run, and Richard Lopez will hunt you forever. You can never come back. She looked down. You can still make a peace. Broker a deal and sell the girl to those people down there. Then Richard will forget. You don't think so, but money will make him forget. Plenty. Moby and Blue Eyes and the rest are nothing in comparison to the amount of money we're talking about. Nina watched fearfully. If he sold her, they'd be rich for certain. He could buy peace with his father. Lucky and smart. I need to be lucky and smart. The smart thing was to give Nita up and buy the safety he couldn't beg for. But just handing her over to her enemies made him feel nauseous. The smart thing was to turtle down and let the girl and let the girl go and make profit in this bargain. Her fight wasn't his. He looked to Pima. He just shrugged. I told you what I thought. Blood and rest, he muttered. You can't just give her to them. It'd be like giving Pima to my dad. But a lot safe for you, Tool suggested. Naylor shook his head stubbornly. No, I'll take her to the Orleans. I know how to hop the trains. This isn't light crew. This isn't light crew. And a short quota, Tool said. You won't get second chances. You make a mistake now, and you die. You ever jumped a train, Sadna asked. Rennie told me how. Before he went under the wheels, Sanna said. We all die, Tool rumbled. It's only choosing how. I'm going, Naylor said. He looked at Nita. We are going. Something in the way he said it got through this time. No one tried to protest. 
They just accepted it and nodded, and suddenly Naylor felt as if he made the wrong decision. He realized that part of them had wanted, to, had wanted them to talk him out of it, to find a way to convince him not to run. You'd best be going then, Tool rumbled. Richard will be coming to sell the girls. Good luck, Hema's mother said. She dug into her pocket and offered Naylor a handful of bright linen red Chinese cash. Run hard. Don't come back. Naylor took the money, surprised at the amount, feeling suddenly alone. Thanks. Hema ran back, uh, ran back to the camp, returned with a small pack that had been blue eyes. She handed it over to Naylor. You scavenge. Naylor took the pack, feeling water sloshing in it. He looked at Nina. Ready? Nina nodded eagerly. Let's get out of here. Yeah, he pointed through the jungle. The tracks are that way. They started out through the clearing, but Tool called after them. Wait. Naylor and Nina turned back. Tool studied them with his yellow killer eyes. I will go as well, I think. Naylor felt a shiver of fear. We're fine, he said at the, at the same moment as Pima's mother smiled brilliantly and said, Thank you. Tool smiled slightly at Naylor's hesitation. Don't be so quick to turn down help, boy. Naylor had a dozen retorts, but all of them were based in his distrust of the half-man's motives. The creature frightened him. Even if Pima's mother trusted him, Naylor didn't. It worried him that someone so close to his father and Lucky Strike was going with them. Why now? Nina asked suspiciously. What do you want? Tool glanced at Sadna, then nodded towards the uh, nodded towards the beach. The patrons down on the ship have half men of their own. They will have questions about my presence. It will not be a convenience for anyone. We can make it alone, Mailer said. I am sure, Tool answered, but perhaps you will benefit from my wisdom. His sharp teeth showed briefly. Be glad he's willing to help, Sadna said, and turned to Tool and clasped the huge hand in both of hers. I owe you now. It is nothing, Tool smiled, and his sharp teeth showed again. Killing in, pla in one place or killing in another, it Makes no difference. Okay. Yeah. So he's. Run. Yeah. Sadna being my favorite character, just because she's a badass. And um, Tool being my second. I don't know why. He's just fun. Um, I actually think there's a book about how how he gets his own freedom and everything because the the like all the all the half man and new people are are um have like conditions put on them where they just naturally obey anywho the ground shook as the train came up at them they crouched in the ferns the engine roared towards them toward them excuse me The engine roared toward them, then flashed by. Naylor swallowed as the machinery rushed past. Wind pummeled his face and tore at the leaves of the trees and ferns around him. The train seemed to suck him, to suck him forward to where the huge wheels, each as high as his chest, blurred past. They beckoned him to throw himself on their passing weight, inviting him to be chopped into pieces and left bleeding as the train roared on. With rising fear, Naylor realized that it was 
one thing to speculate idly about jumping train, and another to watch freight cars hurl past. It was enough to make him reconsider his options. To review the possibility of stealing a skiff, of sailing the coast instead, or of walking the jungle and swamp route. But they had no supplies to make that run, and if they went by water, the clipper ship out on the bay would pursue them with ease. There was no other option. They needed to run, and they needed to run. The train cars went past in a blur. From a distance, they seemed much slower. Now, up close, they were horribly fast. Was the train speeding up? When, Re when Rini had jumped the train, it, w it had always seemed to be going slower. That seemed easier. Naylor knew that depending on how aggressive the, in the engineer was, the train could go much faster than was actually jumpable. That was how Rini had finally gone. Misjudging the speed, he could leap aboard. He'd also been drunk and stupid, but he'd been lulled by the, all his other successful jumps. Naylor and Nina and Toole all stepped out from the vines and clambered up the raised rail bed to the tracks. The wind buffeted them as the train were past. The noise of rushing cars was as bad as a city killer storm. Naylor glanced back at his companions. Nina's eyes were wide with fear. Toole watched impassively, perhaps even with contempt. This would be nothing to the half-man. Naylor found himself wishing that Tool were big enough to simply pick them up and carry them as he jumped aboard. Quit fooling yourself. Hurry up and jump. They were running out of time. The end of the train would be approaching. He needed to commit. It was like being in the oil room all over, knowing that the only way to survive was to dive, and dive deep. But that time, he'd known that there were no other choices. This time, he kept trying to find another way out. Go, he told himself, but his feet stayed rooted. Rini had jumped the trains all the time, had boasted about it. As Naylor Hart pounded in his chest, he tried to remember everything Rini had ever done. He took Nita's sh shoulder and shouted in her ear, You run ahead of the car, let it catch up, then grab the ladder and don't let go no matter what. He pointed at the wheels. If you fall, you go under, so never let go, no matter how much it hurts. He said it again. Don't let go. He paused. And get your legs up in a hurry. She nodded again. He took a deep breath, trying to get his bravery up. Suddenly, Nita dashed ahead. Naylor stared, surprised, as she ran beside the train. She seemed pathetically small beside the rushing wheels and the ladders that ran up the sides. One ladder whipped past her. Another. She wasn't even looking at the ladders of the train cars. She was just charging along beside the train, her black hair bouncing behind her in a ponytail. One ladder, two, three went by. At the fourth, she leapt. Her hands caught the crossbars and she was jerked forward. Her legs flew out into the air, torn out from under her. Her feet came down, then flew into the air again as, as she hit the ground. She was like a rag doll being dragged. She was going to be sucked under the way wheels. Nella waited, thinking he would see her torn apart. But then she curled her legs under her, and she was suddenly on a board, clambering up the side of the train car. She hooked her arm in the ladder and looked back. Already, she was becoming distant, carried away by the speed of the train. The end of the train is come, Tool observed. Naylor nodded, took another breath, and started running. Almost immediately, he understood why Nita hadn't looked back. The ground was uneven beside the track, even though it looked smooth from a distance. The tracks where Rini had jumped the train had always been smoother than this. Naylor had to keep his eyes ahead if he wasn't going to fall. Beside him, the speed and noise of the train were dizzying. Cars blurred past. He kept imagining himself tripping and falling under the wheels, torn apart by the train. He was running as fast as he could, 
over the uneven ground, and still the ladders whipped past him. How the hell had she done it? How had she? He glanced behind, wanting to be able to see cars coming up. The movement and noise were dizzy. He stumbled and almost fell into the train's he caught himself and forced himself to look straight ahead. Picked up his pace. He counted. He counted time as ladders flickered past. One, two, then a count of three for the center of the train car to pass. Then one, two, again. He prayed to Pearlie's Ganesha and the fates. One, two, pause. One, two, three. One, two. The first ladder flashed past. Naylor grabbed for the second. It caught his hand, slammed him away, slammed him away, spinning him. His legs tangled. He fell, rolling over the gravel and weeds and came to a stop. Train cars whipped past as he lay in the dirt, bruised and stunned. Blood ran from his scraped knees and numbed his hands. His shoulder was a bright blossom of pain. Tool flashed by, hooked easily on a ladder. The half-man looked down at Naylor as he went past, yellow eyes watching him, watching, and passive to Naylor's failure. Naylor scrambled to his feet. Nita was almost gone. He started running. The end of the train was coming up. His leg was bruised from the fall, and he limped as he ran. His shoulder felt as he torn as he felt as if he had torn it once again. Limping, he couldn't get as much speed. Ladders blurred past. Again, he timed them, glanced back. The end of the train was there. Now or never. Naylor put on a burst of speed and leapt as a ladder swept past. Instead of grabbing for a rung, he, he grabbed the side of the ladder with both hands. His shoulders exploded with pain as his arms were yanked forward, and he was dragged with the train. His feet bounced over the rocks, bright pain blossoms. And then he pulled himself into a ball, dangling low off the ladder. The ground blurred beneath him. Wind ripped at his clothes, choked him with, his, with its heat and force. He scrambled for a new handhold, found a rung, and pulled himself painfully away from the rush of the rocks beneath. Another handhold, and then he was up and climbing with the wind tearing at him and the trees of the jungle blurring emerald as he shot past. His arms were shaking, his whole body tingled with adrenaline. His legs felt weak, but he climbed, clawing his way higher until he was at the top of the freight car and could see down the length of the train. His feet were scraped and battered, his knee oozing blood. His hands were raw, but he was safe and he was alive. Far ahead, Nita and Tool were watching. Nita waved. He waved back tiredly. Then hooked his arm in the ladder and let his body shake. Eventually, he'd have to make his way down the length of the train and rejoin them. But for now, he just wanted to rest. To be grateful that for the first time in days, clinging to a speeding train, he felt absurdly safe. He looked back the way he had come. The twin rails of the train tracks were being swallowed by the dense jungle. Every minute on this train took him farther from his past. He had to smile. His whole body hurt, but he was alive and his father was in the distance. And whatever lay ahead, it had, been, had to be better than what lay behind. For the first time in his life, he was safe from his father. The thought of safety reminded him of Pima and her mother, still there. Still facing more days on the cruise, facing whatever retribution his father might to devise, it worried him. In the heat of escape, he hadn't been able to concern himself with what the consequences might be for them. He had so desperately wanted to get away that he couldn't think of anything else. But now, suddenly, the two of them were on his mind, like spirit demons plucking at guilt. Looking back the way he, they'd come, he used his free hand and touched his forehead and touched his forehead to the fates and prayed that they would be all right. That they would be able to hold Richard off. That 
He would believe the story that Tool had betrayed him for the sake of a reward, and that Pima's mother and Pima hadn't been the ones who had stolen the lucky strike from his hands. Naylor prayed for the people he had abandoned, and then he turned his face forward again and let the wind rush past. He opened his mouth, gulping at the heat and speed and smells of the jungle. Through his eyes, a flash of ocean showed, blue and bright. The train was slipping towards the shoreline, and in the far distance he caught sight of the moored clipper ship, its sails glinting in sunlight, the white gull resting on a mirrored sea. He grinned at the sight at the thought of all those swings who would be scrambling now, trying to find them in the jungle. All of them never realizing they had been fooled and that their quarry had outwitted them. The view of the ship and the ocean disappeared, hidden again by the emerald tangle of blurred leaves and vines. Nala turned and peered down the length of the train, looking ahead to where the towers of Drowned Orleans would eventually arrive. I could go on one more, or we can stop here. It's almost 10.30. Whatever you feel like. Um, you're doing a good job. Mm -hmm. I could manage one more, I think. The problem with the clever escape was that it helped to have planned for it. In their rush to slip away, they left with few supplies, and riding in the gaps between the train cars meant it was impossible to scavenge for food. Within hours, Naylor was starving. He thought longingly of the dinner he had, he had had the night before. He wouldn't have thought that by sitting still they would have hardly needed to eat. After all, it wasn't like working light crew, but his body was already whittled by a lack of food from his time of fever, and now his belly pressed again against his backbone. There was nothing to do about the problem, so he gritted his teeth and felt his belly grind on the emptiness and promised himself he would scavenge a feast when they arrived in the drowned city. The train, in addition to the access ladders to the roofs, had tiny service platforms between the cars. But these were hardly more than steel planks, two feet wide, suitable for standing and working, but terrible for hours of riding. Early on, Tool made his way down the length of the train, hunting for open bays in the train cars, but he was unable to crack any of the steel compartments, and so they huddled in the train cabs with the ground blurring beneath them, and the wind whipping all around. It was awful, and yet still better than the hot roofs of the trains, with no protection at all from the blaze of the sun. Sleeping on the brink of the wheels was possible. They pinned themselves between the ladders, perched precariously above the blurred ground, and slept in nodding shifts that broke off in abrupt moments when the train jerked forward or slammed to a slower speed. All of the trains all the trains braking and acceleration came in jerk, and shuddering decelerations that threatened to throw them off their perches. After Naylor and Nita were nearly thrown down into the train cab, they rode with their arms threaded through the ladders. Another time as the train slammed itself to a slower speed, Tool almost crushed them. His whole bulk smashing into them, smashing them into against metal and leaving Naylor's head ring. But all those discomforts were nothing against their lack of water. The few bottles they carried in their pack were quickly drunk, and by the second day, all of them were parched and hollow in the heat and humidity. There was nothing to do but watch the landscape rush past, and I hope that the train would reach its destination soon. Sometimes huge lakes passed. They debated jumping from the speeding trade into the pool and biting water, but Tool shook his head and said that they would never catch a train again. 
at this speed, and unless they wanted to spend days walking, they must suffer instead. Naylor resented the idea, even though he hadn't wa wanted to ever try to jump a train again, and knew that the huge creature was correct. So, while they killed time and watched the landscape roll past, they talked. Who are the people who are after you? Naylor asked Nina. Why are you so important? It's Nathaniel Pice, a business marriage uncle. She hesitated, then said, He and his people want me for leverage. Naylor frowned, confused. Nina saw the lack of comprehension. My father learned about some of his dealings. Pice was misusing the, the family's corporate resources. Now Pice wants to use me to keep my father making trouble. I'm the best way to put pressure on him. Pressure? Pice wants my father to allow something he disagrees with. If Pice controls me, my father has to acquiesce. Pice stands to make billions, if and not in dollars. Chinese red cash. Billions. Her dark eyes poured into him. That's more money than your shipbreaking yards will ever make in their entire lifetime. It's enough to build a thousand clippers. And your dad's against that? It's tar sands development and refining. A way to make burnable fuel. A crude oil replacement. The valuation has gone up because of carbon production limits. Pice has been re refining tar sands in our northern holdings and secretly using Patel clippers to ship it over, over the pole to China. Sounds like a lucky strike to me, Naylor said. Like falling into a pool of oil that's and already having a buyer set up. Shouldn't your dad just take a cut and let Pice run with it? Nita stared at him in shock. She opened her mouth, closed it, then opened it again. Closed it, clearly flummoxed. It's black market oh it's black market fuel, tool rumbled, banned by convention, if not in fact. The only thing that would be more profitable is shipping half-men. But that, of course, is, Ill is legal. And this isn't legal at all. Is it, lucky girl? Nita nodded unwillingly. Pice is avoiding carbon taxation because of territory use in the Ar Arctic. And then when it goes to China, it's easy to sell. It's easy to sell it untraceably. It's risky, and it's illegal, and my father found out about it. He was going to force Pice out of the family, but Pice moved against him first. Billions in Chinese red cash, Naylor said. It's worth that much? She nodded. Your father's crazy, then. He should have done the business. You gotta look at him with disgust. Don't we already have enough drowned cities? Enough people dying from drought? My family is a clean company. Just because a market exists doesn't mean we should have to serve it. Naylor laughed. You trying to tell me you blood buyers have got some kind of clean conscience? Like making petrol is different than buying our blood and rust out on the wrecks for your recycling? It is. It's all money in the end, and you're worth a lot more of it than I thought. He... I thought so. No problem. And you're worth a lot more than I thought. He looked at her speculatively. Good thing you didn't tell me this before I, before I burned the boat with my dad. He shook his head. I might have let him sell you after all. Your Uncle Pice would have, be, would have paid a fortune. Nita smiled uncertainly. Certainly. You're serious. Yeah, I wasn't sure how he was feeling. It's a lot of damn money, he said. The only reason you think you've got morals is because you don't need money the way regular people do. He forced down a feeling of despair over a choice that was made and couldn't go back on. You want to be like Sloth, he asked himself. Do anything to make a little more cash. Sloth had been both a traitor and a fool, but Naylor couldn't help thinking the fates had handed him the biggest lucky strike in the world, and he'd thrown it away. So how do you end up in the storm? 
if you are so valuable. My father sent me south to keep me out of reach if there was violence. No one was supposed to know where I was. Her eyes got a faraway look. We didn't know they were coming. We didn't suspect. She corrected herself. Captain Aaron's men said we needed to run. He knew. I don't know how. Maybe he was one of them and changed his mind. Maybe he had a feel for the fates. She shook her head. I don't know. I'll never know now. But I didn't believe him, and so I delayed, and our people died because I didn't believe I was... Her face hardened. We barely got out of port, and even then they were after us, chasing us all day and all night. When the storm came, we didn't have any choice. It was either try to run from the storm or surrender. It was either try to run the storm or surrender. Captain Aaron's men gave me that choice. You couldn't make a deal, Naylor asked. Not with Pice. That man doesn't negotiate when he's already won. So I told Aaron's men to head into the storm. I don't know why he agreed. The sea was already high. She made a motion with her hands. Waves coming over the decks. Almost impossible to walk and no clear winds. Just a storm howl. All around us, tearing us to pieces. I was sure I was going to die, but if we surrendered to Price, it would have been the same. She shrugged. So we turned into the storm and the waves kept coming and our sails snapped. We lost our masts and the waves came in through the windows. She took a shuddering breath, but Pice's people turned back. You risked everything, Toll rumbled. I'm a chess piece, a pawn, she said. I can be sacrificed, but I can't be captured, cannot be captured. To be captured would be the end of the game. She stared out at the greenery. I have to escape or die, because if I'm captured, they will have my father, and they will make him do terrible things. If your father wishes to sacrifice himself for you, Tool said, perhaps he knows best. You wouldn't understand. I understand that you sacrificed an entire crew to his form. Nita stared at him, then looked away. If there had been another choice, I would have taken it. You have loyal people, then. Not like you, she said it with surprising venom. Tool blinked once, slowly. Yellow eyes bright. You wish that I was a good dog man? That I kept allegiance to Naylor's father, maybe? That he was. Yeah. <laughs> he blinked again. You wish that I was a good beast, like the ones on your clipper ships? He smiled slightly, showing sharp teeth. Richard Lopez thought your clean blood and clear eyes and strong heart would fetch an excellent price for the, from the harvesters. You wish that I had stayed loyal to that? Nita gave the tool a dirty look, but her knuckles were pale, and she clenched her fist. Don't try to scare me. Tool's teeth showed bright and sharp. If I wished to scare a spoiled, rich, protected creature, I would not have to try very hard. Naylor interrupted. Cut it out, you two. He touched Tool's shoulder. We're glad you came with us. We owe you. I didn't do it for your debt, Tool said. I did it for Sadna. He looked at Nita. That woman is worth ten times whatever your wealthy father is worth. A thousand times what you are, whatever your enemies may foolishly think. Don't tell me about worth, Nina said. My father commands fleets. The wealthy measure everything in the weight of their money. Tool leaned close. Sadna once risked herself with the rest of her crew to help me escape from an oil fire. She did not have to return 
and she did not have to help lift an iron girder that I could not lift alone. Others urged her not to. It was foolhardy, and I, after all, was only half a man, Tull regarding Nita steadily. Your father commands fleets, and thousands of half-men, I am sure. But would he risk himself to save a single one? Nita scowled at him, but she didn't reply. Silence stretched between them. Eventually, everyone settled down to sleep as well, as well as they could in the creak of the jolt of the train. Zip! This is why I like Tool so much. List. Yeah, and he's also he's also like just loyal to like good people. Like people who help each other. He's yes, he's people. Yeah. The great down drowned city of the New Orleans no, New Orleans didn't come all at once. It came in portions, the sagging backs of shacks ripped open by banyan trees and cypress. Crumbling edges of concrete and brick undermined by sinkholes. Kudzu swamped clusters of old abandoned buildings. Excuse me, sorry. Uh, of old abandoned bitty buildings shadowed under the loom of swamp trees. The train rose into the air, rail pilings lifting it over the swamp below. They passed over cool green pools full of algae and lily pads, the white flash of egrets and the whir of flies and mosquitoes. The entire elevated track system was reinforced against the against the city killer storms that rolled into the coast with such astonishing regularity. But it was the only evidence that any people successfully inhabited the jungle swap lands now. They sped above the mossy, broke-back structures of a dead city, a whole waterlogged world of optimism, torn down by the patient work of changing nature. Naylor wondered at the people who had inhabited those collapsing buildings, wonder where they had gone. Their buildings were huge, larger than anything in this in his experience at the shipbreaking yards. The ones were the good ones were built with glass and concrete, and they died just the same as the bad ones that seemed to have simply melted in on themselves. Leaving rotting timbers and boards that were warped and molded and sagging. Is this it? Naylor asked, is this the Orleans? Nita shook her head. These were just towns outside the city. Support suburbs. They're everywhere. Stuff like this... Stuff like this goes for miles. From... From when everyone had cars. Everyone? Naylor tested the theory. It seemed unlikely. How could so many people be so rich? It was as absurd to everyone owning clipper ships. How could they even do that? There were... How could they even do that? There's no roads. They're there, she pointed. Look. And indeed, if Naylor scrutinized the jungle carefully, he could see... He could make out the boulevards that had been before trees punctured their medians and encroached. Now the roads were more like flat... Flat fern and moss choked paths that had you had to imagine none of the trees none of the trees sprouting up in the center, but they were there. Where'd they get the petrol? he asked. They got it from everywhere, Nita laughed. From the far side of the world, from the bottom of the sea. She waved at the drowned ruins. And and a flash of ocean. They used to drill it out there too, in the Gulf, cut up the islands. That's why city killers are so bad. There used there used to be barrier islands, 
but they cut them up for their gas drilling. Yeah, Naylor challenged. How do you know? Naylor laughed. N Nita laughed again. If you went to school, you'd know it too. Orleans City Killers are famous. Every dummy knows about them. She stopped short. I mean... Miller wanted to hit her smug face. Tool laughed, a low rumble of amusement. Sometimes Nita seemed okay. Other times she was just as wank, smug and rich and soft. It was those moments that made Naylor think she could have she could have learned a thing or two on Bright Sand's speech. That even Sloth, with all her greed and willingness to betray him, had been better than this rich wank, who still looked pretty even after living amongst them all, as if she weren't touched by the grime and pain and struggle that the rest of them felt. I'm sorry, Nita said, but Naylor shrugged away her apology. It was clear what she thought of him. They rode in silence. A, villi a village showed through the jungle, a clearing carved from the trees and shadows. A small fishing community perched amongst the bogs, dotted with slumps, slump shacks like the ones that Naylor's own people constructed, with pigs and vegetables in the yards. To him, it looked like home. He wondered what Nita saw. At last, the jungle parted, opening on a wide expanse where the trees were lower, and the height of the train gave them view. Even from a distance, the city was huge, a series of needles piercing the sky. Orleans, too, Tool said. And I'll stop there. Is a good job. Thank you. Got it. Oh well. Okay. Um, thank you, everyone. I'm going to uh, end here tonight. Uh, oh, hold on. You're roboting. Uh, how about now? Much better. Okay. Um, but yeah, thank you, everyone, uh, to come out who came out. Um, not much of the way of chat tonight, but that's all right. Um, I could probably finish this book up in two more sessions, maybe. Very cool. But yeah, we'll we'll uh, we'll continue next week at Friday. Uh, tomorrow we are running Descent into Avernus. Um, Monday we are doing uh, Back to Forest. Yes, Monday we are Back to Forest, a homebrew game. <laughs> Tuesday, we are back to vamp being vampire. That's about all I know for Party White Gaming. So those are the ones I'm in. Um, so we will also be over. Oh, yes. That is over on Forgebreaker's channel. We finally get to get back to that after two months. Hopefully. Real mad something happens. <laughs> Someone's going to get sick. And be like, oh, I can't do it. It's like, I keep coming back. But, but, yeah, we'll see. Like, I was joking about that with the people on Packet Laws. It's like, like, yeah, Tomb of Annihilation doesn't like me. It's like, because I died, like, four times in Outro's game. And it's like, and I've been dead for going on two months <laughs> in this other game. Two months? It's like, we haven't played in two months. I've just been dead this whole time. <laughs> Yeah, it's getting, ugh, it'll be nice to just finally get back into it. Anywho, um, I am Jay, uh, I also have, um, a, a Twitch, which I am still getting used to. Twitter. Um, Twitter, sorry. Twitter, which I am still getting used to. Uh, it is at Jim Shay. I wanted it to be at Shay Gem, and I made I taped it out as Shay Gem, but it switched as well, switched it around and did a little dyslexia stuff, and um, it is now at Gem Shay for some reason. Um, but I do art. I post some of my art there. 
Um, if anyone wants, you know, commissions or anything, um, all they have to do is, you know, um, send me a probably, I, I'm going to have to figure out how, um, how it works because should my email be listed there? I mean, you can leave, you can leave your personal you don't have a high enough following spam. Yeah. But we'll do that then. Yeah, you still need to get your uh, mission card to start sending you stuff. Yeah. Um, yeah, we'll yeah. get that all <laughs> situated. I've been having a lot of uh, back and forth with um, with uh, legal, legal annoying court stuff so um i've been a bit preoccupied but yeah um but yeah this has been you know my story time i hope you all enjoy righty we're gonna go raid night i think i'm gonna send will we Gonna go raid a friend of ours. Oh, she hasn't been streaming in a while. She's playing Apex Legends. So anybody who likes those kind of battle royale games, stick around, check her out. Otherwise, Night, everyone. See you tomorrow. Bye.